Revelation, please, and chapter 19. <clears throat> we'll end the afternoon session as we began it, looking at the king. Matthew chapter 1, of course, tells us of a king born. The Lord Jesus was not born to be a king. The Lord Jesus was born king. For the Canadians amongst us, um, and for the English, uh, he was, uh, he, he was uh, uh, Prince Charles was born to be a king. But he wasn't born a king. When the Lord Jesus came into the world, there was a, usur a usurper on the throne, an Edomite. <coughs> And uh, there was no legitimate king on Israel's throne. So the moment that blessed man came into the world, he was king. And Matthew chapter 2, where is he that is born king? I did notice in a, reading, uh, uh, so a writing somewhere recently, they spoke about him as being born to be king. But child of God, the Bible doesn't speak of the Lord Jesus as being born to be a king. He was born king. Revelation chapter 19, it tells us of his manifestation as he comes forth as king. Verse 11, I saw heaven opened, behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the, uh, upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now may the Lord grant his blessing to the reading of his good and precious word once again this afternoon. I was rather struck with that last statement of verse 20 when speaking about the fact that the uh, man of sin, the beast, and his false prophet, when they're both going to be taken and cast alive into the lake of fire. I used to think that these two were going to be the sole occupants of the lake of fire for a thousand years. Because we do know from chapter 20 that it's at the end of the millennial kingdom, the Lord Jesus is coming back here now to establish his millennial kingdom. And that millennial kingdom is unfolded in chapter 20. And then at the end of that millennial kingdom, we discover how that the great white throne is going to be set up in space. And the wicked dead are going to be summoned to stand before God to give account. And from that great white throne, cast into the lake of fire. And I, I just assumed that the man of sin and the false prophet were going to be alone in the lake of fire for a thousand years. But I've gleaned a little more, child of God, since then. And I find that when the Lord Jesus does come back to earth again, in the book of Matthew in chapters 24 and 25, in chapter 25 he's going to be a king sitting upon his throne. And in chapter 25 he is going to gather the living nations before his throne when he comes and establishes it here upon the earth at Jerusalem.
And you remember chapters 24 and 25, how that the, uh, the uh, world is going to be divided into two, the sheep and the goats. The sheep, uh, those that are redeemed and have got saved during the tribulation days. But again, the goats, those that have never been saved during tribulation days. And from that great white throne, uh, from that throne at Jerusalem, the judgment of the living nations, in Matthew chapter 25, the Bible tells us that those that have never been saved are going to be cast uh, into eternal fire. They're going to go away into everlasting judgment. I'm just trying to press home a little now what our dear brother said in relation to uh, the gospel. You know, it could be uh, that people that are alive today will see the great events that we've got before us here. This is not the rapture, of course. The rapture is going to take every believer out of the world. What we've got here is the coming of the Lord Jesus back in manifest glory to the world. And I do believe that the rapture takes place very imminently. I do believe that there'll be a vast number alive when the Lord Jesus comes back to the earth again. And it could be somebody sat in this room today. You're not saved. You be very, very careful. Because the great white, thr the great white throne judgment may not be the judgment that you stand at. You might stand at the judgment of the living nations. And from that, you will join the, uh, the man of sin and this, uh, this false prophet in the lake of fire. I don't believe they're going to be in the lake of fire too long before others join them. When the Lord Jesus judges them in Matthew chapter 25. That in Revelation chapter 20 to me is for the unsaved dead. Those that have died down the ages that were never saved. At the end of the millennial kingdom they're going to be raised up and they're going to stand at the great white throne of God. That great white throne of God is not for salvation. That's it. That great white throne of God is for condemnation. And men are going to be cast alive or are going to be cast into the lake of fire from that great white throne. Let's take a look at these few things here in chapter 19 for a moment. Lovely things to me that the coming of our Lord Jesus in resplendent glory, the man that this world has cast out, the man that this world rejected, bless God, there's coming a day when our Lord Jesus is coming in great glory and going to take honour here in this world in which he was rejected. I never forget a dear friend of mine, he read these verses and the ones before it, the ideas of it anyway, at a wedding. Another good friend of mine was getting married and he read chapter 19 of the Revelation. He said, I hope you've noticed that it divides itself into three parts. He said in uh, verses 1 to 6, you've got the worship. He says then in uh, verses 7 uh, down to verse 10, you've got the wedding. He said and for, from verse 11 onwards, you've got the war. The worship, the wedding, the war. I don't know what he was inferring now. Whether he thought that the uh, worship, you know, when you, when you first cast your eyes upon that girl and led to the wedding, whether it was going to lead to a war, I'm not too sure. But uh, I think Mr. Adams now would be very happy to tell you that there's not been too many years of war in the 60 years that they've been married. And the Lord bless them for that too. And the rest of the time that they are together until the Lord comes. The Lord bless every marriage here. But uh, I just thought it was interesting. That is the division of the chapter, child of God. In verses 1 to 6 we have worship. Four hallelujahs. Those four hallelujahs, I believe, like every other four in the Bible, divide into a three and to a one. For every four in your Bible does divide into a three and a one. They talk about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospel, similar to the eye. John's gospel, unique in its character, uh, and a little different uh, from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, a three and a one. Here, these four hallelujahs. You know what they're about, of course. These four hallelujahs are on the judgment of Babylon. Bless God, there's coming a day when all that has ever opposed our God, our God and our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be brought under judgment. And, uh, of course, Babylon, uh, ever speaking of that religious evil that raised its ugly head right back in Genesis chapters 10 and 11 with Nimrod, that tower of Babylon, and so on, and uh, when scattered across the face of the globe, carried those evil doctrines right across the globe, struck me child of God that every religion of earth is ever linked with a tower 
<coughs> Christendom linked with towers. Every steeple you, say, you see takes its origins from Babylon. Those black garments that they wear, they're spoken of in the book of Ze uh, Zephaniah and elsewhere as the Chemerim. They literally mean the black robed ones. Those black robed ones were the priests of Babylon. So uh, if you see Christendom today uh, and you see them dressed in the black robes, let me tell you, they're Babylonish robes. For Babylonish doctrines are predominated and dominated throughout so-called Christianity. And they have their towers. I came across here. They took me to some park out there in Vancouver. And when they took me to the park, they took me to the, uh, to the totem poles. I couldn't help think of a tower. For you see, there's a tower linked with your, Indi uh, with your Indians of North America. If you go down to the Indians of South America, to the Aztecs, and if you open your National Geographics, they'll show you the cities, but in the middle of it, a tower. If you were to go out to the east, and you were to look at the, uh, at the Hindu temples, they're all built in towers. For Babylonish religion, child of God, in one form or another, has dominated the whole of the world. It's coming back for judgment, you know. It's refuted everything that is of God. It's set up not the word of God. It's led people in rebellion against God. Ah, well, God's going to judge it. And when God judges it, then we, we see here at the opening of chapter 19, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The only hallelujahs in your New Testament, aren't they? And those four hallelujahs, child of God, on the judgment of everything that's opposed God. God doesn't want you linked with evil now, religious evil, let me tell you. Dear brother, we were talking together about chapters 17 and 18 downstairs a little earlier. And he was just reminding me of that verse. Come out of her, my people. Be not partaker of her sins. God doesn't want us linked with relig religious evil, child of God. Thank God there's an assembly today. Thank God for saints gathered to the name of our Lord Jesus. Thank God for what this lovely book says, Revelation. When speaking of those saints at Philadelphia, they've not denied my, uh, my name. They've kept my word. The Lord loves that, you know. Where his name is honored. Where his word is kept. Child of God, I hope there's nobody here linked with the Chemerins, linked with the Towers, linked with Babylonish religion. I trust we're all linked with our Lord Jesus Christ, and I trust we're linked with the name of our Lord Jesus. But those hallelujahs, the first three, uh, they are certainly linked with, uh, with the uh, uh, praise of God in relation to the judgment of Israel, uh, uh, with the judgment of Babylon. I wonder if the last one that you have there in verse 6, uh, 3 and a 1, when it says, uh, I heard as it were a great vo a voice of uh, a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, let us be glad and rejoice. Child of God, not now over Babylon's fall and Babylon's judgment, but rejoicing now over the marriage of the Lamb is come. When's that evil thing has been dealt with? Now the union can take place. The saints have been of God have been gathered home. And now the marriage can take place. You and I, linked to the Lord Jesus Christ as his bride. What a glorious day that's going to be. Once that wedding has taken place, the Lord Jesus, he can come out of heaven. And here's where we are in verse 11 of chapter 19. I want you to notice the opening statement. The opening statement, John says, And I beheld heaven opened. There's a lovely picture, I think. Uh, Brother Larry Steers, he, uh, he uh, quoted it at one of the conferences here in the last few weeks, looking at chapter, chapter 4 and verse 1. In chapter 4 and verse 1, there's a door opened in heaven. And a voice says, Come up hither. Child of God, a lovely picture of the rapture. When our present testimony on earth is finished, that's chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book of the Revelation. When our testimony on earth is finished, there's going to be a door opened. The trumpet voice is going to ring out. And the saints of God are going to be gathered into the throne room of heaven. We're going to see the coronation of the king, you know. 
That's what chapters 4 and 5 are all about. The chapters 4 and 5 is the coronation of our Lord Jesus. In chapter 1, he's the prince of the kings. In chapters 4 and 5, he takes the book, the title deeds to universal dominion. One that can carry out the mind and will of God for God. And the scene is set. It's a lovely scene, isn't it? Chapters 4 and 5. I wasn't at the coronation of Prince Charles when they crowned him Prince of Wales. But I saw some of the pictures, heard on the radio about the trumpeters, and the tremendous fanfares made as they made him Prince of Wales. Child of God is not to be compared with what's going to happen when our Lord Jesus takes the book and is made king. Little wonder at the end of chapter 5, beginning at the throne, with those four living creatures, the four and twenty elders, and then the angels, and before long, every creature, all ascribing glory to God's lovely Son. I think that's where Hebrews chapter 1 and is it verse 6 begins, that all the angels of God worship him. When he came in incarnation, you know, they didn't worship him. The angels came when he came. That's Luke's gospel, isn't it? And there was that great multitude of the heavenly host. By the way, brethren, they weren't, God, they weren't bad gospel preachers, you know. Some people tell us they can't preach. Well, I don't know. I wish I could be as faithful as they were, you know, when they said, unto you is born this day in the city of David, a saviour, which is Christ the Lord. It's not a bad message, you know, is it? I don't mind messages like that, you know. Oh, the angels can preach all right. The fact that God has, uh, has given the keys to Peter to open the door to Jew and Gentile, Acts 2, Acts, ch Acts chapter 10, doesn't mean to say that angels can't preach. And nor does it tell me that angels do preach uh, in this day and dispensation. God has given it to you. He has given it to me. Angels retire to the throne room of heaven. They look down on the gospel in this day and dispensation. But child of God, they can preach. And I see a book, uh, in the book of the Revelation, there'll come a day when, again, there'll be angels preaching that everlasting gospel. Oh, well, I'm getting carried away, aren't I? I always do. Forgive me. Let's go back again. Because if I don't, we'll never get finished and you'll not get your, your supper and I'll get shouted at. So uh, it's the last bit I'm worried about, you know. It's not you get, not getting your supper. It's the last bit I'm worried about. But um, chapter 4, verse 1, a door opened. You brought into the coronation to hear finally the great fanfares rising of universal praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. But I love chapter 19 and verse 11, child of God. It's not a door opened. It's heaven opened. Oh, well might the hymn writer tell us. The heavens, uh, should, well, how's it go? They, oh, I forget it. I, that's right. As bright a father, the very heavens opened, child of God. A door opened to let you in. But the very heavens opened to bring Christ out. The splendor, the glory of that occasion. As the Son of God is coming forth in majestic splendor. You see how he's coming? Says verse 11 again, he's coming as a rider on a white horse. Now I've noticed in chapter 6 and verse 2, there's another rider on a white horse. I believe the rider on the white horse in chapter 6 and verse 2 is none less than the Antichrist. The man of sin, child of God. He's riding on a white horse. The great imitator. The one that's denying the Christ of God is right here. The idea of a rider on a white horse it, it is one that's literally going to take the conquest of earth. And in chapter 6 and verse 2, when that bow is given to him, and here's one that's going to reign and going to rule here until the Lord Jesus comes. Ah, well, the true king is coming. And when he comes, he's riding on a white horse too. I notice in chapter 20, which is the millennial scene, uh, the horse is set aside, a throne is set. For when the government of the millennium is going to be raised, child of God, my blessed Lord is going to sit upon throne, on a, upon a throne, but here is coming in conquest. Matthew, Mark and Luke tells us he's coming in the clouds with great power and glory. A cloud would ever be a symbol of deity. When the Lord Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, a cloud received him out of their sight. 
God had gone back to the glory. But when he comes back, child of God, a cloud is going to bring him back. A manifestation of the presence of deity as the Lord, as the Lord comes back to the earth. I notice in the book of Thessalonians it's not a cloud. He's coming in flaming fire taking vengeance. And again, let me remind these sinners here. Sad that you can be sat amongst saints. But heading to eternal doom. For says to Thessalonians one, uh, chapter 1, he's coming in flaming fire. Taking vengeance on them that know not God and them that obey not the gospel. I'm very glad our brother put it very plainly today. That you have a responsibility to believe. And there's no reason why in this meeting you should not bow your knees to God and to Christ and make him your saviour. Remember that lake of fire is not far away. Remember the Christ of God is coming and when he comes in Thessalonians he's coming in flaming fire taking vengeance. Who on? Them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not saved friend let me tell you there's great peril for you at the coming of our Lord Jesus back to this world and a lake of fire before you and you could be there and never see death but I believe that's what Matthew chapter 25 would teach us but here bless God he's coming on a white horse he's coming to conquer the earth he's coming to take universal dominion I love how he comes he's coming as the he's called faithful and true I notice there are names given to our Lord Jesus as he comes in verse 12 he has a name written that no man knew child of God I just say to you a secret name I don't know who's going to enjoy that name is it something that he and the father alone can appreciate all I do know is that in verse 12 the man that's faithful and true in verse 13 he has a name uh, uh, in verse 12 he has a name written that no man knew but he himself the secret name in verse 13 it says and his name is called the word of God I thought of that as the searching name I notice in John chapter 1 uh, when he's the word that's what he is to God I notice in 1 John chapter 1 when again he set forth the word that's what he is to me I notice here in the book of the revelation it's John that uses his expression the word is what he is to the world and child of God he's coming forth searching in a day to come but then there's a lovely name again when you go down to verse 16 when it says he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written not a name that no man knew not now the name the word of God but king of kings and lord of lords king of them that exercise kingship and lord of them that exercise lordship written on his uh, 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 on his uh, vesture and upon his thigh child of God manifested in all his glory for who he is and what he is king of kings and lord of lords how is he coming out this king of kings and lord of lords well go back to verse 12 if he's coming out as the rider on a white horse in great conquest of earth he's coming out with, uh, uh, with his eyes as a flame of fire and on his head many crowns I like that for you see there has been a usurper there has been another rider on a white horse the man of sin the Bible says of him child of God that he has uh, he has upon his head ten crowns for you remember that image and those ten beasts and the so on and the ten crowns upon his head limited authority for the man of beast uh, for the man of sin the beast but when the Lord Jesus comes bless God no limited authority here many crowns these are not Stephanus crowns you know the good brethren tell us the victor's crowns I'm always a wee bit naughty you'll have to forgive me I don't know how Adam got that do you because that's what God gave to him in Hebrews chapter 2 the Stephanus the victor's crown well, I'd, well of course if you believe it was the Lord Jesus in Hebrews chapter 2 but anyway come back here child of God these are diadems diadems 
This is the kingly crown set upon his head. The Lord Jesus is coming out of heaven. The heavens are going to roll asunder. The Christ of God is coming forth. His victory is absolutely assured. The names that mark him tell us something of who and what he is. But bless God, here he is, arrayed with the great crown, the victors, uh, the, 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 the diadems, the monarch's crown. And no limited authority for our Lord Jesus Christ, universal authority for the blessed Son of God. When we come down to these verses, we see that when he comes out, uh, the, these, uh, cha- these verses tell us that uh, in this chapter we have two women, Babylon, the bride. In this chapter we have two suppers. We have uh, uh, in verse uh, in verse seven, is it the marriage supper? No, that's the marriage itself. Uh, it's verse nine. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we come to verses seventeen onwards, we have the second supper. The, the supper of the great God, as it's called at the end of verse 17. What is that supper? Child of God, that supper is just the flesh of all that have opposed him. Are these they that have gathered at Armageddon? Have they come to uh, seek to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to destroy what is of God here? But I notice here in verse 17, God is going to take dealings with them. He's told the birds to come and fly in the midst of heaven. Gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God. That's a different supper, isn't it, to that of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessing and rejoicing with that. Here, this supper is just going to bring, uh, uh, bring feed, carrion for the, for the birds of heaven. In verse 17 and 18, you have the call. Uh, in these next verses, uh, what the, uh, the, the conflict, and in verse 21, what they're going to consume. And I notice it's the flesh of kings, captains, mighty men, horses, free men, human pomp, pride, everything stripped child of God. Only one is going to take the honor and take the glory, our blessed Lord, as he comes. And all that's ever opposed him going to be brought down and going to be brought low. Bless God, everything destroyed at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we see again, these kings in verse 19, if they're joined together to do battle against each other, as I feel they must be initially, as they see the heavens opened, and as they see the Lord Jesus coming out of heaven, now it says, the kings of the earth and their armies, they're gathered together to make war against him. He's coming back. We never thought we'd see it. If we nailed him to a cross in a former day, all oh, what weapons now to blast him out of the skies. Hey, you thought they could do it, wouldn't you? With the hydrogen bombs and everything else that they might have lined up at that time. But let me tell you, there's no battle. Just a word from my blessed Lord. That's all. Just a word. The sword that goeth out of his mouth. Hebrews 4 and 12. Tells us it's the word of God. Just a word. Enough to deal with all of earth. I think of it in the garden, you know. They came to take him. The Lord Jesus is not on his face in John's gospel. He might be in Matthew, Mark and Luke. He's God in John. There's no uh, Gethsemane sufferings in John. There's no genealogy in John, is there? God cannot be born. There's no temptations in John. You cannot tempt the Lord Jesus. He's God. There's no sufferings in the garden in John. And I notice the only people that are on the floor in John are those that came to take him. As he said, whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. What did they do? They went backward and fell on their faces to the ground. Child of God, just a word. And that word, the ego I me, the I am, the eternal ever existent God was enough to, co- to cause men to fall on their faces before him. He's coming back. The heavens are going to open. The rider on the white horse is going to conquer us. The many diadems are going to be upon his head. He's faithful and true. 
faithful to God, true to all that he said. He's coming back in manifest glory. The world will see that he's king then. And when the world sees that he's king then, as his garments are, 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 are full of the mighty titles that God has given to him, the men of earth are going to be brought to naught before him. The beast of the false prophet, opposing God. Child of God, they don't need to be judged. Their sin is apparent. They'll never stand at any judgment. They'll never know death. They'll not be joined with men in burial, taken and cast alive into the lake of fire. And well might those good brethren tell us of a former day. Two men in the Old Testament that went to heaven without dying. Two men in the New Testament that went down to the lake of fire without dying. The Lord Jesus, absolutely supreme, and at the beginning of the next chapter, establishing his glorious kingdom.